And uh, today we have a special guest, Steve Shadow. He's not a CEO member, but he traveled from Seattle, Washington to here to really support this training session. So let me introduce Steve first, if you don't know him. And actually, when I was doing a concert catalog at, you know, at the Columbia University, he was my trainer for concert at CCTP program for E-Series. I learned from him. Okay, so Steve's primary responsibility at University of Washington Library is to manage the library linking system that provides access to journal full text. In addition, she catalogs E-Series selected and licensed by UW libraries. Steve's background in serious standards begin with his work as an ISSN cataloger at the Library of Congress, and currently includes serving on NISO Standing Committee for Preservation and Identification for e I mean, Electronic Journal, PyJ project. And Steve is an accomplished cataloging trainer and gives regular presentation in library cataloging and the metadata and the role a role library systems play in the providing access to contents. Let's welcome Steve. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I always have to adjust the mic. Um, the, and I do have a connection, a little bit of a connection to the CJK community, only in the sense that I do catalog CJK serials that are not included in our East Asia library. So it's mostly scientific technology, a lot of forestry and a lot of fisheries. So I am f a little tiny bit familiar, teeny tiny bit familiar with your issues um, just from that experience. So what I'm gonna talk with you today about is, are the uh, PCC provider neutral record guidelines. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna provide an overview and rationale we're gonna talk about the specific guidelines, and then we're gonna take a look at a couple examples. Okay. So the definition of a provider neutral record, it's a bibliographic record representing all online manifestations of a resource made available by multiple online providers. Okay, so the key points, it's a single record. That single record represents all manifestations of an online resource, okay? And that man those manifestations can be made available by multiple providers, by different providers, okay? So this isn't the same thing as the single record approach. And a lot of people confuse those two terms because the terms are sort of similar. But the single record approach basically says we take the record for the print version and we add online information about the online version onto the print version record. Like you take the print version record and add an 856 to it. No, that's not what this is. This is a separate record for the online version, but that online version provides information about multiple providers, multiple access, okay? And also I just wanna say this is not a session on how to do electronic serials cataloging. <laughs> Um, uh, that takes a whole day. <laughs> so, um, but the reason that um, the uh, concert uh, began talking about this back in 2003, and the reason for this was prior to 2003, concert catalogers would create separate bibliographic records for serial titles that were available from different online providers and they would use a, 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 a uniform title qualifier to distinguish those. So prior to 2003, you have an example here. I know it, the print is small, but you have separate records for the American Journal of Sociology available from JSTOR than the version that's made available from Elsevier or Science Direct. Okay? So we had separate records prior to 2003, and we would use uniform titles to qualify them. Now, at that time, especially with serial titles, the uni and this was, what, 14 years ago now, the uniform title was sacrosanct in the sense that you really didn't change a 130 on a serial record. Once it was established, that was the citation form of that serial title, and you really, you really didn't change it, okay? But then in early 2002, um, David Van Hoy, who was the concert liaison at MIT at the time, 
reported, the number, uh, reported that a number of journal titles had been transferred from Wiley to Elsevier. Um, this is not uncommon for journal titles to be purchased, to be transferred. You know, a publisher decides they don't want to publish anything anymore, another publisher buys it. It's not an uncommon thing to happen. Those of you who work with serials know that how do we handle it with a serial? We add a 500 note that says published and then we provide the publishing history in a 500 note. Or these days we provide an additional 264 field that indicates, you know, with dates that indicate which publisher published a particular publication over which date span. Okay. Um, but back then, uh, we had, uh, and so this was the first time after we've been cataloging electronic serials that we sort of hit this situation with a large number of titles where the titles have been transferred from one publisher to another. So what was David supposed to do with this? At the point that these titles go over to Science Direct, is he supposed to treat it as a title change because there was a change in the corporate body qualifier? that the corporate body qualifier would be going from Wiley to Elsevier. So is that a major, that, that would be considered a major change under the old rules. And actually under the new rule, under current RDA practice as well. You know, if you have a corporate body qualifier in a work title and that corporate body changes, then that's considered a major change and you create a new record. So is it the case that David would create a new record and link them with 780, 785 fields but then on the other hand, if you do that, what about the original Wiley title? It doesn't even exist anymore. Because all of the, if all of the issues went from Wiley to Elsevier, and Elsevier is now serving it up on its platform, on ScienceDirect, what hap why do you have a record that's describing nothing. It's describing something that's not there anymore. So then do you use one record and you change the uniform title qualifier, but then what do you redescribe with? Do you keep the original description from the Wiley, or do you redescribe based on the Elsevier? And what happens? Do we need? Do we even need to have a record of that prior Wiley publishing? Okay. So, and more importantly, what would happen if a cataloger who didn't know that Elsevier had purchased these Wiley titles? They just go in, they're doing original cataloging, and they just see the Elsevier title. So they just catalog the Elsevier title. There's not a record for it in there already. They don't know about the relationship between Wiley and Elsevier for this title. So they're going to create a separate record anyway. You know, so, um, so David sort of brought this issue to Concer. Concer had a conversation about it and came up with a reasoning that should the bibliographic record be describing the history of online licensing arrangements for a particular title? Because in a large part, that's what it comes down to. Especially when, in cases where the publisher hasn't changed, but the platform has, or the publisher is still the same, but they're now licensing the online version to different providers, to ProQuest, to EBSCO, to a number of providers. So what is the bibliographic record really describing? Licensing arrangements or the bibliographic entity? So that, with that sort of guidance then, um, Conser came up with what was called, at the time it was called the aggregator neutral approach and now it's called the provider neutral approach. So in spring 2002, Conser um, proposed a new approach where you would have all one bibliographic record for all online manifestations of the same e-journal. Now note, here we say the same e-journal. Okay, so if you have, if the content is different, then they can probably, just like with the RDA definition of work and entity, if the content is different, then consider it a different publication. But for the same e-journal, you would have one record we would discontinue use of the provider name and a uniform title qualifier. And we would limit provider specific information to a small number of mark fields. So PCC adopted this approach for serials in 2003, um, basically with the CONSER program. When it seemed to work well for CONSER, 
then PCC adopted the approach for textual monographs in 2009 and for all formats in 2011. So this practice, the provider neutral practice, applies to all formats currently, um, and it is a PCC practice. So I just want to show an example of why use the provider neutral record. This is a screenshot from a search for Agricola in connection. Okay. All of the uh, arrows, the records with arrows, are all pointing to different versions of the same Agricola database. Okay, just available from different providers, from Silver Platter, from EBSCO, from ProQuest, directly from the National Agriculture Library. Okay, and all of these records basically clutter the database and makes it more difficult for catalogers working within connection to be able to identify the record that they really should be working with. Okay, so instead of having multiple records describing the same resource on different platforms, you have one record that has a series of 856s and possibly other notes associated with the different providers. Okay. By the way, I tend to steamroll through presentations, so if you have any, don't hesitate. To, if you have any questions at all as we're going through, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So there is a series of documents that the PCC have prepared to support the provider neutral approach. The most recent one was the provider neutral e-resource mark record guide published in January 2013. Um, and there's the URL for that. In that record guide, it does state that libraries can make local policy decisions on whether to use single or multiple records for their e-resources. So locally, like anything else, locally you can do whatever you want. Okay, but whatever records are marked as PCC records need to follow the provider neutral approach. Okay. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention on this resource, the provider, this, the mark record guide, is this is an example uh, of a metadata application profile that basically most of the document, except for two pages of introduction and some background information, pretty much all of the document is just a listing of mark fields and, and guidelines for all of the specific mark fields about provider neutral information. Okay. Okay, there are also some format specific provider neutral guidelines that provide examples and more background information. So there was one that was created in 2011 for the e-monograph. Um, now in that one, I'm actually a little surprised, I was just reading through it on Thursday, and I was a little surprised to see that these guidelines indicate that any, any cataloging in OCLC should be following the provider neutral approach. Um, instead of just specifically PCC records. Um, so you can do what you want to with that, but I just wanted to point that out, um, that that's going to state that in those guidelines. There's also, within the Integrating Resources Cataloging Manual, there are, um, there is, there are examples and a section on the provider neutral approach there. And within the Concert Cataloging Manual, there's also module 31, which is uh, cataloging electronic serials. There's also a section on there on following the provider neutral approach. So those are the resources that you can use um, to support your work with cataloging online resources. So I just, there's some other things that I just want to talk about um, that you want to bring to mind when you're working with online resources in general. Online providers, such as China Academic Journals, Korea Information Science Society, JSTAGE, um, let's see, I already have KISS in there, I can't remember some, any, what are some of the other ones? Oh, Japan, well, Japan Knowledge, yeah. Um, they're not considered publishers from the bibliographic perspective, they're considered providers. Information about online providers only appears in a few places in the uh, MARC record. Okay, the preferred transcription source re is the resource itself, not the website. 
Now, the reasoning for this is because we want to try to keep consistency. If we have a publication that's published in print and then made available online, we want to keep consistency between the print version record and the online version record. It's the same issue with microforms. PCC practice has, has generally been to catalog, to use as your source of information what has been um, filmed and not the microfilm itself. Your first choice is to describe from the issue or from the book that's filmed and not from the actual, like the first frames of the microfilm itself, okay? So, and the reason for that is to try to keep the description consistent between print and microfilm or between print and online, okay? Now this can be a challenge if the publisher does not scan um, the same sources that you would use for cataloging. And this is common to see with journals, where with journals the only thing that's scanned or made available are the articles and not the cover and the front matter. Okay, so that's always, that's gonna, always going to be an issue. Now, you do have an option that I'll mention here, but I'll go, I, it's on the list, but I'll mention it now as well. When you have this kind of issue, and you have a good print version record already available for you, you have an option to base your description on the print version record. And you just put a note in the record that says description based on print version or description based on print version record. And that, and that will keep your records in sync between the print and the online. That's only if the online provider has not provided you with the sources that you need to, to adequately catalog the resource. Okay. In fact, I either, in fact, I just said that right now. <laughs> uh, so, um, online versions can take different forms. They can be actual reproductions, meaning they can be scans of, of earlier publications. They can be simultaneously issued. So oftentimes, or sometimes the online will actually come out ahead of print but they're generally simultaneous. You know, or it may be a born digital collection that the only thing that's available is a digital version. If you go back to that Agricola database, the only version of that is a database. There's no print form of the Agricola database. There's no print directory, okay? All of those kinds of resources can have the provider neutral approach applied to them and should be if you're going to mark the record as a PCC record. In addition, if an online version is available from more than one provider, so, so the publisher has licensed it to more than one organization or vendor, prefer the publisher's version if the publisher's version is available. So for example, if I have a journal that is published by Wiley, I have the current issues available from Wiley, but, the, but another set of issues available on the EBSCOhost platform, I would prefer to use the publisher's platform as the basis for description. Okay. Um, and if the publisher's platform isn't available, prefer the most complete version, meaning the one that would digitize more of the sources. Now, if the versions from different providers have significantly different content, uh, and by that I don't mean things like EBSCOhost has the run from 2006 to 2012, and then Wiley has it from 2010 to, 20 to current. I don't mean a difference in the issues that are available. But if the resources are actually two different resources, like the publisher has it in the original in Chinese, but then EBSCOhost is making a translation available, you know, those kinds of differences, then go ahead and create separate records because those really are different resources. Um, but generally prefer using a single record. Um, you will find when you're working in OCLC that there, with online resources, that there will often be many records available uh, for the same resource. This has to do with the fact that there are machine loads of records av um, available when, when people do um, 
retrospective conversion, um, or they might, there might be different preservation projects that are working on the same kinds of records. And in fact, that's, in preparing for this, I was looking at a lot, at many more CJK records than I normally do. Um, and I was finding where most of the duplicates actually are, and these are represented in the handouts, in the examples you have, are Hathi Trust. You know, Hathi Trust, for CJK materials, there are not that many English language cataloging sources that are contributing CJK records for online resources. In most cases, any duplicates that you run across will be Hathi Trust, will be created from Hathi Trust. Okay. So, and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll talk through some of those examples, some of those fields as well. Now, go ahead, when you run across these, go ahead and report them as duplicates. Even if both of them, if, they, if you have two records that are Hathi Trust records that they both say have an 042 that says DLR, and we'll talk about the 042 code in a minute, it's like, they're still duplicate records. Doesn't matter, they're still duplicate records. They can be reported to OCLC. If you're not sure about it, don't report them. But they do clutter the database. And in fact, there's a couple of the examples. I think not the Chinese example, but I think the Japanese and Korean example that I provided actually have completely duplicate records that the URLs, the Hathi Trust 856, the 856 field with the Hathi Trust URL in it is the same for both records. I mean, it looks like a complete duplicate record. There's no difference, there's a difference in who contributed it, but they're both pointing to the same thing. So feel free to report those to OCLC. Um, I don't know how many, does everyone here work in, I assume everyone here works in connection? Pretty much, okay, good. Um, Personally, my favorite way to report duplicates is to use, when you got the menu bar, is just to use the red flag because it just takes you, you type a 936 in, you hit the red flag, you type a one sentence note that it's a duplicate, send it and it's done. You know, there's no need to compile lists, there's no need to email anything, you know. Um, and OCLC loves to get those. <laughs> I know from real life experience. Um, so, there, however, talking about the Hathi Trust records, there are some issues with reprints because current cataloging practice in the PCC community is to catalog a reprint separately. So, but we're only making one record for an online version. So you might have multiple print, quote unquote, print records if you have an original and a couple reprints. Um, associated with a single online version record. So if you, if what, if the print version that's getting pointed to from that online version record is specifically a reprint, a reprinted edition, I would probably just leave it, not report it as a duplicate. Go ahead and just leave it sitting there separately. There might be some additional information. The reason that we catalog reprints separately is that oftentimes there is a small amount of additional information in there that provides context that's not necessarily in the original edition. You know, so go ahead and leave those, don't report those as duplicates. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the mark fields, the specific mark fields that are affected by the provider neutral record. Uh, the ISBN field, the O2O, you will, now publishers, because publishers assign ISBN, we all know they are completely all over the map in terms of how many they assign, what they assign them to, you know. Um, so, in an online version record, the O2O subfield A is specifically for an E-ISBN, specifically, okay? So only EISBN should go in subfield A. Record other ISBN, uh, most likely they're gonna be the print ISBN, in subfield Z. If it's not clear what format is represented by an ISBN that you're looking at, just assume it's, the print, it's probably the print version and put it in a subfield Z. Okay. So this means you might have, an o, because it's the provider neutral record and it's representing different online versions, you might have multiple you know, subfield A's and subfield Z's across that O2O, that's fine. That's what we expect. 
the 022, the ISSN for Serial and Continuing Resources, there will only be one, and this is ISSN network policy, because ISSN are assigned by national libraries by the network of ISSN centers around the world. There will be only one ISSN assigned for all electronic versions. So that goes in the 022 subfield A. Um, and then any other ISSN that are associated with the publication, like a print ISSN, would go in a subfield Y. And again, if you're not sure, put it in a subfield Y. If, if the publisher is printing or displaying an ISSN on an electronic resource, but unless they say like EISSN, or unless you have other evidence, I would assume it's print. Okay, the 040 code, um, in addition to subfield ERDA, which you should be using for your RDA records, um, we use a subfield EPN for provider neutral. Um, technically for any cataloging, because it's PCC practice, to always use the provider neutral record anytime you are cataloging an online resource and doing PCC authentication to it, you will add the subfield EPN. I know a lot of catalogers forget this, including myself. So, you know, it's fine, but that's that's what the practice, that's what the practice should be. Okay, 246, variant title fields. When you have a print version record that you are either using as the basis or you just have it for information about the resource, go ahead and carry over the, two, the 246s from the print version record into the online version record because it's the same resource they will likely apply or provide useful access. In addition, if you have provider specific titles that are only represented in one provider but not in another one, go ahead and add those in the 246 as well. So uh, as the example that I have on the, on the screen here, the title proper that was chosen for this particular database was FIAF International Index to Film Periodicals Plus. So that, was the, so that was the version that was used by the cataloger to create the description. But then some providers actually present the title as FIAF databases online. Okay, so you can just have a generic note that said some available from some providers under the title or some providers you know, have published this with the title or just some reference to the fact that, it's a, that this title is used by some other providers. Okay, now for 264 for your publication information, again, do not consider the online provider to be the publisher, okay? Consider the original publisher of the resource to be considered the publisher, okay? And I have no idea what this says, I just, <laughs> <laughs> my Korean's not that good. But obviously, um, in this particular case, DBPIA makes it available. They are not, because just because they make it available, it is not considered the publisher. And in fact, in this particular case, let me see if I have a cursor here. Oh, I don't have a cursor here. Okay, so in this particular case, you have a publication statement right here that shows the actual publisher of this journal. And then down at the bottom of this home page for the journal, you have this presentation here that's from DPPIA. Okay? This is the publisher for the purposes of the 264 transcription, not that, okay? Okay, uh, continuing on, uh, 347 field, it's mentioned in some of the P PCC guidelines, um, digital file characteristics. For the provider neutral record, we actually do not record anything here because the file sizes, the file sizes themselves can vary between providers depending on how they encode it, what information they put into it. So we don't record, for the provider neutral record, we don't record um, the file size. For the dates of publication, for the 362, this is for serials. If the pro provider does not make the first or the last issue available, 
record the beginning and ending numbering and dates from the physical version. So, and you actually put in a statement that says, if you have, if the print began in 2001, but what the publisher has scanned and digitized is only from 2012 forward, for the purposes of the 362, go ahead and say print began with, and then provide the information. So don't say, again, don't say it began with, if, if Wiley, no, if Science Direct makes available from 2011 forward, don't say it began with 2011 if the print version actually began back in 2001. Because you don't know who is going to later on go back and digitize those earlier issues. Okay? So again, your fixed field dates and your 360 dates don't correspond to a specific provider. They correspond to the publication as a whole. Okay, uh, for 500 and 550 for general, general notes and for issuing body notes, there should be no information about provide specific provider information in these notes. Um, we'll see some examples in a, in a minute or two that show where provider specific information goes. One of those places is in the source of description. So, for all online resources, it is PCC practice to have, and it's RDA, to always cite um, the version of, the, the, uh, of the, the version that the description is based on for online resources. Um, and you will also sort the t uh, cite the source of the title, the bibliographic source. The way that that is always formatted is you have description based on, for, for integrating resources, you, it'll just, you'll just use the phrase online resource. If it's a database or some website or some kind of integrating resource, you'll just use the phrase online resource. Just so that everyone else, all your other cataloger friends know that, oh, they were actually looking at the site, that's where they transcribed it from. For, um, and that'll be true for monographs as well. For, yeah, so for databases, websites, monographs. For serials, you will, just like you do for print serials, you will, you will cite the specific issue that is the source of transcription. And then after you cite the specific part or issue or just online resource, then you cite the specific source. That first example is title from title screen. Uh, the second example is title from the PDF title page. So you cite the specific bibliographic source. And then you cite the provider. Uh, within the parentheses. So in the first case, the, this publication is a database or a website that's available from Apabi. Um, I have to go back and find the example now to see what was actually being subscribed, what was actually being described there. Uh, in the second example, uh, it's concert practice, and again, this is just concert practice, but to use the phrase publisher's website, so if you're actually transcribing from the actual publisher site versus a secondary provider, then go ahead and just use the phrase publisher's website, and then, you, and then finally you'll have the viewed date. Okay. The third example there is one that's description based on print version record. So if for some reason the online version doesn't give you, doesn't have good enough sources for you to make a good transcription, or for any other reason, you can just base it on, you can base your catalog record on the print version record and note that with a 588 description based on print version record. And then for serials, you will also have a latest issue consulted note that follows the same format as the description based on in terms of citing the issue, citing the provider, and citing the viewed date. Okay, this series of mark fields, the 506, the 533, the 538, and the 583 are the most common, in fact, they are the only fields that are used for reproduction and digitization projects. So these are the fields that if you're running across a Hathi Trust record, for, as an example, these are the fields where you will see spe the specific Hathi Trust information. So um, in this example here, we have, we have that 245, 
And then we have these four fields, the 506 that says this is a use copy, restrictions unspecified, that's the access restrictions. 533 is the reproduction note. 538 is the system requirements note. And 583 is the, um, the, digi uh, the digitization reproduction note. Okay, that has to do with, and, and, and typically Hathi Trust records, pretty much most of the Hathi Trust records look like this. It's these four fields. If you have other digitization projects, you can, if you, for example, if you find a Hathi Trust record, but you have a local digitization project that you want to add that information, it is perfectly okay for you to add that information to the PCC record. That is perfectly appropriate. All you need to remember to do is on your fields, add the subfield five with your institution code to indicate, those of you who have done microfilm cataloging should already be fairly familiar with this. Okay, just add that subfield five code with your institution to those fields that you're adding to the OCLC record, to the PCC record, okay? And that's perfectly appropriate. The kinds of information we don't want to see in these fields are general notes, like a 506 field, access restricted to subscribers. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it is sort of a useful piece of information, but it might not necessarily be the case for all providers. You know, the publisher may actually make partial content available on an open access website, or they, make, they may make their older content, and that only might be the one provider. So that kind of information can vary greatly from provider to provider. You know, I can think of a number of cases where the publisher is making available um, a book on their platform that you purchase, but then that same edition is also available on the directory of open access books. You know, so that information is not necessarily um, valid across all providers. And the 538 mode of access World Wide Web note is something from about 15 years ago that it's like, yeah, if it's an online version record, where else is it gonna be but on the web? So those kinds of notes we really don't, don't use or don't need anymore. I mean, if you have the exception, if you have something that's on a local network, for example, maybe use the note then. And the only place it's available is on a local network, but. Okay, series statements. 490 and 830 fields. Transcribe and record series statements only if it applies to all providers, all known versions of an online resource. Do not record package or provider series in a 490 or 830 field on a bibliographic record, okay? So no science directs, no ProQuest eBrary, no Project Muse eBooks, none of those go in 490 or 830 fields. The information about the fact that it's from those providers will already be in the 856 field, so you don't need to provide series statements in the provider neutral record. Now, in this particular case, the example that I, looked, that I found for this one was, I think this is from, oh, this is from ProQuest, this is a ProQuest eBook. Um, but the book itself was published in a series called Contemporary Chinese Studies. Okay, so that would be a legitimate use of a series statement for any resource. Okay, okay let's talk a little bit about uh, added entries. Again, just like with the series statement, Use of the information, uh, use it if the information is applicable to all known versions of the online resource. Again, do not use for package or provider names. So if you have a journal editor, if you have an issuing body associated with a journal, that's great. But again, don't use a corporate body or personal name or any of the title kind of added entry for things like China Max Digital Library or China Academic Journal Series F Literature History Philosophy or Japan Knowledge Library, okay? Again, those are only specific to one provider. Okay, we're getting, we're getting down close to the bottom of the mark field, so bear with me. 
Now, where most of the information about providers is going to go, I mentioned the digitization information is those four fields that we already talked about for digitization and preservation projects. But where a lot of the provider-specific information is going to go is in the 856 field. Again, you will want to use, for 856, you will want to use URLs that are general, that are not institution-specific. In this particular example, this is this bottom one here. I'll go ahead and, because I know my voice carries, so. This is the perfect example of an institution-specific URL. When you look at this domain, first of all, it's an educational institution here instead of a publisher. Second of all, it's an easy proxy. So the only people who can actually use this link in any case are going to, I don't even know who, obviously, Hong Kong, I don't know who. Baptist. What is it? Baptist. Oh, Hong Kong Baptist University. Oh, Baptist University. Instead, what should be used in the 856 is actually probably this source right here, because that because the that part of the URL just directs the session through Easy Proxy to get to here. Okay, so this oh, why thank you. <laughs> Gosh, oh man, I'm going to start doing my karaoke in a minute. Um, <laughs> So this URL is going to be the one that's going to be appropriate for you to have in the 856 and not the proxied URL. Okay. Now, um, okay. uh, and so then on the other two examples here, what you can do is if the domain name is not sufficient to identify the package or if you want to just make sure that the provider name is in there somewhere, you can use the subfield three. So in that second example, uh, subfield three, ProQuest, and then it gives the ProQuest URL for that publication. Okay. Also, I've seen this happen, I've seen this from time to time, that I see some catalogers who are working with serials who put the coverage dates for that particular provider in that you are in the subfield three as well. So they might say something like ProQuest comma and then provide dates. Um, that's okay as well, but the, the only issue with that is that those coverage dates may change over time. So that's a maintenance issue. Um, but then URLs change over time too, so. You know, um, and I think that was one of the other reasons, one of the other advantages of the provider neutral record is to really minimize the elements that are going to require maintenance in a record to just a few fields that you can target rather than the entire record that you might have to like review if the resource, if a, if a database changes in some way. Okay. okay, so I know you're not gonna be able to see this. I never quite know, <laughs> one of the things I'm going to start asking before I do a presentation is, how big is the screen that people are gonna be looking at? <laughs> so I know that you can't really see this. Oh, I'll take the microphone, yeah. Thank you, thank you, oops, are we? On. Are we on? Yes. Okay. Okay. So some information here that is going to be specific to the provider neutral record. I'll go ahead and point these out here. Any online resource, you're going to have your 006 and your 007. Okay. Those are going to be your online indicators. Um, this one, there's a bunch of 019s in here. So obviously there were many, there were like four other records that were duplicate records that have been identified and merged. Um, this one, this is a journal. It has a subfield Y in the 022, an 022 subfield Y, so apparently that's pro likely for the print version ISSN. Uh, let me see what else is in here for. I think that's pretty much it that's provider neutral. Let me go to the next page. Uh, let me see. Do, 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 do. Okay, so here I mentioned the 588s. You have a description based on with the date, the issue date, the bibliographic source, the publishers, the providers, which version, the provider, and the viewed date. And the same way with the latest issue consulted. Uh, 776, back to the print version. That's always useful if you have online version records, especially again with Hathi Trust. Um, 
Hathi Trust typically will take the print version record and clone it to make the online version record. So you'll almost always see a 588 that says description based on, and you'll almost always see a 776 that points back to the print version record. So if you have any questions about the record, if you have any questions about what this record was based on, find that 776, go look that record up, and, it'll be, and you can see what they based it on. So if, you see, if you're looking at the online version, and you go, wait a minute, this is not looking like, like this record that I had. It's probably because the original print version record was old cataloging that was following an earlier standard. Okay, so that's an explanation as to why you might see in a Hathi Trust record something that goes, wow, you know, that might just stop and go, well, that's not RDA or that's not current practice or, I mean, if you've been cataloging like me for over 20 years, I can identify what year that particular practice was happening, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, new catalogers are not going to necessarily recognize, and they're going to be confused about this, I'm not seeing, this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. What am I doing? What, why is this record here? The other thing that I'll go ahead and mention is that I didn't mention in the talking about Mark was the 780 field here. If you'll notice the 780 field, the earlier title is not pointing to a specific record. It's just giving the title. That 780 should not point to a print version record because the, on, the earlier version of the online resource is not the print version. It's going to be an online version record of that earlier title. So if you do find an online version record, then go ahead and fill in the subfield Ws and, you know, and the other information, but just don't accept the fact that you have a linking field. Make sure that that linking field isn't pointing to a print version record unless it's supposed to, like with the 776 field. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and put in a pitch for bib pearls because I know they're important for some people. Um, a bib pearl is basically a permanent URL that serves that if someone, if you click on the bib pearl, then it will redirect to the current version of the URL for that resource. For that resource, bib pearls are a separate service that are maintained by any library that decides they want to maintain a bib pearl server. Um, the only, the most common cases where I see those are the UC system runs their own bid Pearl server. So anyone from UC can talk about, grab someone from UC if you, yeah, I know, sorry, <laughs> just put you on the spot. Uh, or GPO runs a bid Pearl server. Those are the two that I most commonly see. There might be some others, but. Okay. Okay, so this record is for a Japanese language ebook. Oh, shoot. So you're going to see the same 006 fields. You're going, to be, you're going to see here your ISBNs are in subfield Zs because those correspond to the print version, not this online ebook. Everything else about the record, except for obviously the description like the online resource and the 33x fields, um, pretty much everything else is going to be similar to the print version. This one was actually description based on print version. So they actually just cloned the print version record to create the ebook record. But then they did adjust, they did add a 776 pointing back to that print version record. If I remember correctly, see, and I don't work with ebooks, but if I remember correctly, there's actually a, an OCLC macro that will create an online version record from a print version record. So has, who, has anyone used it? One, two. Okay, three, okay. Oh yeah, TJ, okay. Um, yeah, so that's really convenient. If you're cataloging an online version record and there's a good print version record there already, find out about the macro and use it because it saves a ton of time. Um, and then the seven, ooh. I just realized this should probably not have OCLC record numbers on it. The 775 is gonna be your other edition statement. That's which? Oh, this is the digital. Oh, okay. No, then it's great then. Okay, never mind. <laughs> and then for the 856, thank you, Morimoto-san. Um, and for the 856, this cataloger used the subfield three to indicate that it was from Japan Knowledge, as well as the 856. And then we have a Korean language database. So 
The, uh, the coding is going to be for any other database, so your SL is going to be 2 up in the fixed field. You're going to have your standard 06007, um, everything else. This one, the catalog are based, the description based on online resource, and then they provided the specific provider of the database, the view date and the title source. Um, this isn't in the same order as uh, the 588 that we looked at earlier, but the formatting of the 588, especially for, for databases and for ebooks, is really not prescriptive. So as long as it's clear, that's what's important. Um, and obviously, I think everything else in here is pretty much, they put in a 520 that says it's a database containing full text of over 1,700 Korean scholarly journals. So that one is fairly clear. And then I just finally want to look at a HathiTrust reproduction record. Um, we've already talked about the fields. Again, the O2Os are going to have subfield Zs because those, I, those are print ISBN. You'll see the O7s are a little more detailed. There's a few more subfields in the O7s because the O7 is also representing a lot of the reproduction information, the digitization information. Okay. That's okay. Just leave them there. They serve a purpose. That's fine. Uh, I want to mention one other field I have not mentioned here yet is the 042 field. The, what is it, digital life? I forget what DLR stands for now. <laughs> anyway, uh, HathiTrust and a couple other providers uh, are doing these digitization projects that they wanted to be able to identify their records easily using authentication codes. So, um, those records will have an 042 DLR on them. Okay. Um, they can still be edited. If you have, if you have editing, auth editing authorization, you can still edit them just like you would other records of that same format. If you have separate, if you find duplicate records that both say 042 DLR, the general practice is to prefer the one with the authentication. If they both have that authentication code, then just report, figure out which one you're gonna keep, report the other one for deletion, um, transfer any information from one to the other that you might need to transfer, okay? But that's, the 042 code doesn't carry the same authorization uh, credentialing necessary as like an 042 PCC or, an, or you know, a concert record kind of thing, okay? Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I know, man, this is really tiny. I'm sorry about that. Uh, is there anything else here? Yeah, and this one has the 506. Yeah, this is another Hathi Trust record. 506, 533, 538, 56, 583. Description based on print version record. Um, a link to the print, uh, linking field to the print version. And this particular one is also, the title is also available from China Max. So you'll see the 856, the Hathi Trust URL but then you'll also see the Chinamax URL. Okay, so this is an example where you have two different providers, one a digitization project, one a commercial provider that are both on the same record. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? Very good, 13 more minutes. 13 more minutes, okay, great. Okay, oh, no, I can get rid of this. Here. Thank you. Oh, oh, five minutes? Oh, I just, oh, oh. <laughs> So, sorry, <laughs> the, the director is telling me. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like you to do now, the purpose of the handouts is I'd like you to take like the next five minutes or so, I'd like you to take a look at the two or the three records that you have in front of you. If you want to work, if you want to talk with other people, please feel free to talk with other people. You know, if you're all working on the same kind of, same language of record, figure out which record you're going to keep, what needs to be retained in that record, whoa, and what information needs to be transferred from one record to the other. So which record to retain, what to retain, probably everything, but you want to look at the record, and then what information needs to be transferred from one to the other, okay?
Oh, okay. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, I know. Just turn it on. Yeah, I'm a musician. I'm familiar with mics. <laughs> okay, thanks. So how you doing? You hanging in there okay? Okay, good. Okay, so I just got the word. I know you didn't have much time to take a look at them, but <laughs> I just got the word we should to keep on schedule. So uh, my question for you is what kinds, first of all, did anyone have any problems or issues with figuring out which record to keep? Let me ask that first. And you're not all looking at the same record, so this is going to be sort of a general discussion. Did anyone have any issues with figuring out which record they were going to keep? Okay, yeah, I sort of see, I see people like not wanting to say anything, but I could tell there were questions. Tell, tell you the answers. I'm not going to tell you the answers. Each, okay, so because there's three different, I don't, I don't have all the printouts up here with me actually, to be honest, and we don't have the time to go through every single one of them. In general, if you have something that is, that has an 042 DLR, that's a, that's a, um, that's a digitization project that's, that's got an 042 authentication code in it. Tend to keep that. If you have multiple ones, one of the interesting things about the Chinese one that I thought was very interesting comparing the two Chinese records was that both of those were Hathi Trust records going to different resources. Going, they had different URLs. And they had 776s going to different print version records but when you looked at the print version record, 
the print version records were actually duplicates. So apparently Michigan or whoever was doing the Hathi Trust work on these records, one library chose one print version record, another library chose a different print version records because if you look at the descriptions, and that's one of the useful things to look at when you're, you know, when you're comparing multiple records, when you look at the title, the publication information, the pagination, the description in general, the two Chinese records were identical except one had a longer subtitle that was transcribed as contents as a 505 in the other record. So apparently there was a judgment call on the original print cataloging that the duplicate records, as far as I can tell, duplicate records were made we should only have one online version record, so not only would the print version record, uh, not only would the online version record be reported for deletion, but also the print version records. You would want to question that and report one of those print version records for deletion as well. You do want to confirm that those really are different things. And with Hathi Trust, that can be sort of hard because you don't have access necessarily to the resource. You know, so what I would do is I would probably see either contact the original contributing libraries or contact Hathi Trust to say these look like duplicate records. You know, can you verify that these really are pointing to the same thing? Okay. Now, in one of the other language editions, and I forget which one now, um, when you look at the 856s between the two records, I think it might be the Korean one, um, the 856s are actually identical between the two records. The two 856s are actually pointing to the same exact Hathi Trust resource. So in that case, it's pretty obvious that those are duplicates. And so you just figure out which one you're going to report and, um, and, you know, and do that. Were there any other questions about, about identifying which record to report? Because those were the only two things that I remember that popped up when I pulled these examples. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about what information is transferred over. Did people think at all, did any of you think about what information you needed to transfer from the record that was getting reported to the record that was getting retained? Was there any information? Uh, did any of you get to that point? Exactly. For the Chinese ones, they are pretty much exactly the same record. Yes, and very good. That was ding, 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 ding. That's right. Because actually, if you look at those 776 fields, you'll see one of them has a subfield WDLC in it. So that one was based on, a, on an LC record. It was derived from an LC record. So that probably would be the one that you would retain versus the other one that you would report. Very good. So um, are there any other, are there questions about information, any other questions about information or problems people had with figuring out what to transfer over or what to retain or just any other information about these examples or questions about these examples? Yes. Yeah. Right. It sort of depends on what kind of error you're talking about in the, you're talking about when you're, when the online version is based on the, is derived from the print version, but there's an error in the print version record. Is that what you're describing? Okay. Um, I would go ahead and if, if it's the kind of error that, if it's an error that just has to do with current cataloging practice versus old cataloging practice, I probably wouldn't worry about that. But if it's an actual error, like a transcription error, you know, that, that kind of thing, then yes, I would correct it. If you have evidence from the online version that the print version is incorrect, and, I, and here's a classic example. If the pagination, if you're looking at the online version, and the online version, you've been able to verify that it's the same edition you're working with, you know, the same publication, and it has completely 
digitized, scanned every single page and the cover and the preliminaries. And obviously, you know, sometimes you hit those scans where there will be like two or three blank pages, you know, and then you get to something else. It's like, okay, they actually did scan everything because books always include blank pages at some point, you know, like usually like right before the title page or at the end. So if you are sure that it's a complete scan of the book and information that you're seeing in the scan doesn't match what the print version is, then yeah, I think that would be enough evidence for you to go ahead and edit the print version record. But, but I think you have to be really comfortable with the fact that you're actually looking at a complete scan of the publication before you make that decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, um, I'm a volunteer for Honey Oh, yay! Oh. So what happens with Honey Tech Records is your library pulls them out of your local catalog. So that means they come That's right. under that catalog that sucker 35 years ago and you haven't updated it. That's the record that gets sent to Honey Trust. And then... Mm. Volunteers, you send a not so polite note saying this is a really bad record. What's wrong with you, Honey Trust? We say thank you very much. We have to then contact the contributing library and say, I'm so sorry, that catalog from 25 years ago made a mistake. So it's supposed to be so bad, and if it's an original record, go back to OCLC and make all the corrections, download it to your local catalog, and then resubmit to Honey Trust. Oh, so you mean within Hathi Trust. Right. But it's not a tidy process, and it involves a lot of emailing back and forth. Mm -hmm. Some big libraries don't do it. But in terms of, the, did I accurately represent the process in yes. terms of OCLC for reporting yes. duplicates and all that? Yeah. Okay. So some things will get fixed on OCLC side mm -hmm. um, faster than we can get. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, which reminds me, now I wonder um, if, the other, if there's another question. Uh, that I have, the, the, creation the, 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 question that I have, the creation of multiple records, is it a requirement by Hathi Trust that everything that's contributed already have a record in OCLC? Or are some libraries contributing records that don't have OCLC record numbers in them, thus creating a separate record in OCLC? Do you know? Some of them do not have OCLC record numbers. OK. They're coming out of their local Right. OK. So that might be the other reason for the creation of duplicate records as well. Yeah, OK. Okay, great. Well, I think we've run out of time, so thank you very much for hanging in there, and uh, hope you learned something. Yes. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, no, I was just getting water. I was just getting something. No, 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 I know. No, I don't want to be hauling the equipment down a break. Hello. Let's go to the next session. Uh, okay. Hello, uh, let's talking about CJK numeral. 
And uh, th this work is prepared by uh, the COCTP subcommittee on RDA, and actually the slide was uh, prepared by Charlene. And I'm just representing here, and uh, I'm not expert, but somehow that, uh, remember 2012, we have a first RDA workshop, and uh, we had this issue talking about the CJK numeral because RDA say that you transcribe what you see, but uh, it's a content standard. We have issue with sorting, indexing, display. So we say we need to, at least for the time being, to following AACR2 practice. So we had this uh, CTP committee working on that and communicate with LC. And finally, LC uh, had this LCPCC practice 1.8.2, first alternative that published uh, in August 2015, I think, in that. Uh, so announcements sent out to ESLAB uh, by Charlene. Uh, However, there's still some uh, uh, remaining issue, and that was discussed at the 2016 Charlene lead that uh, discussion, and then we had really good discussion, a lot of comments, and we agreed to send out survey. And then I'd, uh, before we, right before we send out survey that uh, the RDA subcommittee had a question about, say, having member to vote which which one, remember the uh, discussion we had, there's uh, several options, and then we want the member to say which one uh, you thinking it uh, should be our best practice. And then we say, wait a second, we probably want to uh, make a recommendation to have a survey, because uh, some practice, it's our preferred, but may not work well with the current RDA instruction, so that's the reason that we uh, change a little bit, and then so the survey was sent out late than uh, we were uh, scheduled. But thanks for people who participate in the survey, and uh, uh, we will focusing on the uh, survey result. And this is just give you a slide on uh, what was the remaining issue that we are focusing on the serial number on non-numeral uh, characters and ordinal numbers, and there's a content notes, there's a publication date, and there's some others that, uh, let's move on to uh, the first uh, survey question is on uh, non-numeral numbers appear at level one series number. So for uh, 490 field, we recommend follow the LCPCCPS 1.8.2 uh, first alternative substitute Western style uh, Arabic number when non latin script numeral appear on the source. So this one is uh, an example of Shang Zhongxia. Uh, so in this case uh, for uh, Shang, we uh, using one volume, and, and then we gave five, optionally gave 500 notes. And there's a Korean example, uh, same thing. And the survey result is 83 uh, participants that agree uh, to, uh, with this uh, recommendation. So the, uh, the second one is talking about the uh, series numbering uh, it's the same, but it's a different system. They're using Jia Yi Bing Ding, or there's other uh, series uh, that using that uh, <coughs> new uh, non-numeral uh, words uh, expressing. So it's the same when you uh, substitute with a Western uh, Arabic number. And this one is uh, 76. 19% uh, agree, and then there's a comment to uh, saying that I, appear, I prefer transcribing as it is in 490, but substitute uh, Arabic number in 800 field, I would like to transcribe them rather than substitute them. 
And then they'll say that oh, in 500 now, you just say jia and uh, uh, along without yi bing ding. Uh, I think those are our uh, members' uh, idea. And then I have a different idea too. I'd say, yeah, if you just say jia, this is people, you know, young generation, they may not know those are the series uh, sequential, you know. So if you just say jia, does that, they understand why the jia name is uh, substitute as one. So those are kind of, you know, uh, discussion we probably still need uh, continuing on uh, what is uh, by the way we are describing. And then we have uh, non-numeral numbers at the level two series number. So, so they have a number, you know, at the uh, level one, and then they go to the level two, they're using shang zhong xia. And then they, or they're using jia yi bing ding. And in this kind of situation, uh, we try to do the same. We substitute with number and optionally provide notes. And the comments, uh, and, and the survey result is 81%, uh, so nearly 82% agree with this recommendation. And uh, comments say, I prefer transcribe as it is in 490, but substitute a big number that's the same uh, as the earlier, uh, the previous comments. And uh, the this one is talking about ordinal uh, serial numbers that gram uh, grammatically integrated uh, with the series title. So in this case, uh, for 490, you follow 2.121.3. And then um, for the 830, you follow 24.61.3. So this one, we have a higher uh, survey result, 95.45 agree with the recommendation. And common say, Chongwen should be uh, inside reading Shen comma, Chongwen, uh, with comma between Shen Chongwen. I'm not totally understand. This one is a, oh, okay, okay, okay. And this is the ordinal uh, serial num uh, session number grammatically uh, integrated with the series title. It's just, it follows the same rule. And then uh, this one is uh, uh, also get a high 95.24 agreed with the recommendation. And somebody say this is a not uh, ordinal number, uh, but a uh, cardinal number. The next one is talking about session number, the number designation for parts or session of a work expressed as a word in the title for description, follow uh, PS 2.3.1.7, the second one, and, and also the 1.8.2, the first one alternative, and for access point, follow PS 6.2.2.9.2, Remember early in the session that uh, Charlene gave update, and then you're looking at the rules, you know, it's I, I make you hide, try to figure out where they are, and then in this discussion, I make mistake too, you know, I just, it, it's, a, it's not easier to try to say where that rule is, and then what rule we should follow. So, um, so this is a um, very challenging, Topic, even we're talking about CJK number. Yeah, so for this one, the, uh, I, go ahead, go ahead, talk to the, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so, so, so we will have a result place later. Do you know the number? Oh, okay, 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 okay. 
So uh, let's move to the next one. So this one is talking about the ordinal numbers as volume designation in contact notes for multiple volumes. And for our description, you follow the uh, 185 and the PS 25113, this, uh, number six. And so, um, so I'm not reading those example because I want to um, go over quickly so uh, I can, ha can have some time talking about Korean numbers. Yeah, and then, uh, so, uh, so for this one, it's a 79% uh, percent agree with the recommendation. There's uh, more comments on there, and I hope you had the chance to read it. Uh, so I'm not going to go over. And then uh, there's a publication date. You know, what about months, dates? Uh, RDA to say that you uh, you transcribe, you recording them as appear on the source, and for CJK that we haven't decided on what if you have that kind of information, do you recording it? So uh, this is a catalog judgment or institution policy on if you want to record year all in. And, uh, um, but this is just a uh, recommended practice for uh, if you uh, decide not to record year all in, to record that month or day, um, this is our, uh, the example that you should do. And then the survey result is a 91.67 91, uh, 91 agree with the recommendation. So those are uh, uh, still publication data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also publication day that express as a non-numeral word that uh, you will transcribe and then uh, followed by a bracket date. So for the remaining issue and next steps, Charlene, do you want to come over and talk about this? Okay, so Erica? Thank you, yeah. Well, well, I, I, in the end, I mean, after all discussions through email, I um, didn't follow in the e ending part because it was too much and uh, I didn't know whether I had to talk about it. <laughs> So I didn't prepare it really um, well, but um, Korean numbers, uh, I, while we discussed, I thought about one problem, that is uh, uh, <coughs> the native Korean numbers. Nat uh, according, I took this uh, uh, word, wording, native Korean and Sino-Korean numbers. This wording is from the Korean romanization table. And that is uh, basically uh, for the the ordinal ordinal number. Is there is there? 첫 번째, uh, 첫째. This kind of thing is ordinal Korean native number. And this, there is no rule for this Korean native case n numbering case. Um, so. So um, I sent out the mini survey because these Korean examples were dropped um, from the main survey. So I sent out survey to Korean um, librarians to see their response. And the majority didn't like um, this format, the 490 and 830 in series using the uh, native Korean number, because if we um, follow rule that we want to propose to change to uh, Arabic numeral in 490, then we will transcribe, uh, we will say 
uh, one, not, not this one, one Arabian number one dash bonche or one dash je. <laughs> this doesn't sound uh, correct uh, according to the usage, uh, usage um, of Korean in the dictionary. And the in dictionary actually said if you search a chop one dash bonche, uh, dictionary says it's not right. So, <laughs> but this one already corrected. So, um, if we, if the main CJK propose differently, like um, what we want to propose is to change the the um, number to Arabian number, right? So, but for this native Korean numeral, that doesn't make sense. So I would uh, have exception rule for Korean native number to follow the um, RDA 1.8.2 second alternative rather than the first one. <laughs> and second alternative, I, I, I meant to write down, but I didn't. Right? Um, so you record uh, uh, as, as you found on the resource, and then you can add perhaps the Arabian number in the bracket like this form. I, I don't know whether we want this way. And then the A30 will be the, um, the Arabian number only. So that's the phone, that's a series numbering. And the same problem also goes to the 505 content note. 505 also, if we, um, the volume numbering, volume number, um, goes chapponche or chotje, which is the ordinary Korean native number. Then, um, but uh, problem. So, uh, but I think 505 is not a. Um, it's not belong to uh, 1.8.2. It's a separate thing. So, if we want to propose main propo <laughs> CJK propose to change to Arabic, then. I'm sorry. Then <laughs> we can go with that, <laughs> which means we can use just Arabic number, change to completely to Arabic number, rather than transliterate for 505. Um, I hope you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and then also uh, the 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 other uh, type of number. Another ordinal number is J, J il chip, J il chip, yeah. In 490, the series, series, uh, if series numbering um, follow J il chip, uh, because this is ordinal number and there is a rule, 1.8.5, um, this f we can do the same way as Chinese and Japanese, which means we can use J, and um, regardless of the um, regardless of uh, recording the um, the numbering as a uh, Chinese character, Chinese numbering, Chinese numbering one, one, or Arabian one, or Korean character il. We can all just do the same way, like Chinese and Japanese. So J, uh, the numbering, you change it to Arabic, and jip. But the cardinal number, Cardinal number, there is also uh, the, that we have a Korean uh, native uh, number issue, but I would say um, <coughs> we can change this. Uh, if it's a cardinal number, we, uh, we have a hana, hana dul set, or ili sam, or uh, ili sam in Chinese character. This is a cardinal number, and if it's in series, then we can we can change to Arabic number 
in transcribed field two, 490 and 830, both. I'm j I'm just so tired now. I can't. I can't. <laughs> Did I cover everything? <laughs> so basically, basically, um, series numbering, uh, the ordinal Korean native number. That's the issue. So we want to make an exception, and all the other, we can just. Uh, go with the Chinese and Japanese if we propose different, if we propose, right? They will write. So yes, I hope that makes sense. But if we, that depending on how we decide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If we talk about Korean numbering, if Erica thinks she got tired, exhausted, then you can know how I feel. <laughs> okay, um, I remember our first idea workshop, it happened in University of Toronto in year 2012. Who is Stephen Chow? Who is Stephen? Is he here? Stephen? Yes. I remember Stephen helped us for that workshop, and that's our first workshop, and the idea implemented in 2013. Five years passed by, we're coming back to University of Toronto, we still don't know what to do with CJK numeral. <laughs> it is challenging, really, because this major change in RDA transcription is make our life much, much more challenging because in ACR too, we just, you know, convert to every big number. And this change in RDA, somehow it makes the CJK community pretty painful. And also, look at all the Erica example. It just remind me of like a like kind of research paper. You know, you're reading that kind of peer review article, journal article. <laughs> it's challenging, but it's related to the language-specific issues. Okay, so, but the timing is very interesting now, and I just show you earlier with the all the three R project. So we don't know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. So should we, propose, write a proposal now, or maybe we need to think over and just watch you a little bit, and then know what to do, because we don't know what's going to happen with 3R projects, especially with international, it, it's kind of translation software available online. There's a lot of options there, and a lot of things could happen, you just don't know. So maybe we can continue doing research with all the wonderful examples from Erica, and do we really have to propose something right away, or we can wait a little bit longer? What do you think? Okay, speak up, Hai Jun. Okay, so maybe this group, we're going to write a research paper together. <laughs> Yeah, Hai Chin's recommendation is maybe you wait a little bit longer, do more research, and think about this. Do other people agree? Agree? Okay, shoot them. Yes, Chihal. Five years.
Okay, so if you agree we wait a little bit longer, can you raise your hand so we know the consensus? Okay, let's vote. If you agree to wait a little bit longer, can you raise your hand? Okay. Um, we don't know. Okay, anybody? I uh, guess, Sarah? Okay, listen to Sarah, please. Hello. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, I was listening to Erica's argument about the numbering uh, for the 490, and I think we, sh CJK, should have the same practice in, instead of one language going one way and the other language going the other way. And for the 490, uh, personally, I think 490 should be transcribed. And, and A30 could be, you know, whatever, uh, for indexing purposes, we could, we could um, uh, transfer to Arabic number. And uh, the, the advantage of transcribing is that we don't have to add a note to say that, okay, originally this was like this and that. And, and in, a, in a linked data environment, the notes might not be linked to mm -hmm. whatever. Access uh, point. To the, yes. to the access point. So it's just my um, sort of preference. Actually, Sarah, I have the same kind of comment like yours. It just. However, in the past several weeks, it's really challenging because we have to figure out which RDA rule to use is the best for us. Do you know what I mean? Even though we have some sort of preference, then you have to figure out which rule to apply. So it's pretty challenging. So um, that's the reason why I thought maybe we should wait a little bit longer. And first, original intent is if we carry over that LCRI rule, what Morimori san called it is, just converting to Arabic number, as we said before, it could be just simplify things. However, well, for SS point, yes, but then the yes, transcription but part, it's I know, but so that's why you have two options there. You know, we try to simplify, then we have to figure out then how to have the original information there. You know, I totally agree with you, but it just that's why I think we need to maybe a little bit more time to have a better approach. And I agree with you with the CJK one policy and rather than just CJK separate policy, at least we come to some sort of agreement, you know? So, okay, that's four again. <laughs> do we need more time to talk, I mean, to do more research on this and where it be longer for to see the technology available there? If you say yes, can you raise your hand? Okay, if you object, can you raise your hand? Okay, so we still have more. Go with wait a little bit longer, okay? Um, but that's okay because we're running out of time for lunch. So can we recommend here is we can still communicate through emails and still with the CDP, CDP and we talk about this issue. So we are not rushed for a decision or we can, as you can see the slide I mentioned earlier, we can have a temporary solution for now and then I don't know what's the best later on, okay? So what I want to say is uh, thank you for coming. And uh, Hannah is not here, so I just, she just say ready for lunch. And uh, the lunch is already in the back. But I want to say just a few more things first. Uh, we just have uh, the CJK Council Group, the final group organized. So if you are the group, you already volunteer, we would like to have a, a little bit chat during the lunch break. Also, if you're not ready for this project, but you are interested, you can still join us for some sort of discussion. Yes, Laura, you have anything to announce? Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna spontaneously make an announcement if you don't mind. Um, Charlene mentioned I work on Tibetan uh, cataloging at Columbia University, and I do know that some of your schools are doing some work with Tibetan records, often using um, vendor Chinese records. If just in lunch, if you could just find me, we are having a Tibetan resources working group meeting just about an hour or so on Thursday, and I would invite you to join if you want or just to stay in touch. So find me at lunch and we can talk about it if, you, if this is an issue for your university, please.